Welcome everyone to this talk, which is about um, the vehicles in the Mega City demo that I hope everyone had a chance to see yesterday. My name is Andreas Fredriksen. I'm a principal engineer at Unity, and I'm here with my colleague Lee Hamilton. Hello. We are not really the kind of people who put cars in demos. Uh, we're the kind of people who do low-level optimization, and you know, we figured we have shipped a bunch of games, so like. We should put something gamey in this thing. And so that's what we tried to do. And so we decided to put these cars in. Why did we do this? We wanted to have something interesting, window dressing wise, for you to look at when we showed the sample. Uh, you know, otherwise, it's just a bunch of static buildings. So here's the thing we were doing this on a shoestring budget. It was just our two brilliant minds. And <laughs> You know, we, we didn't want to just put cars on splines or something. We wanted a little more than that. So we wanted lane changing, some passing, uh, some on and off ramps and things like this. And our budget, let's say, was tight uh, because we have all this other stuff to move in this demo. We needed it to run on a range of devices. You know, and why are we doing this? Like, we're an engine company. Well, it's important that we run into these landmines before you do. Uh, so that's... I guess the most important reason. So I'm going to give you a really, really simple overview of what we built, and then Lee is going to take you through some of the details. Uh, you start by placing down splines, right? And you do this in the editor. Uh, you then create a vehicle pool. You say, these are the vehicles that I would like to be on this road. You can parameterize those vehicles. It's all very simple. And at runtime, we create a bunch of lanes from the road that's been laid down. We put some vehicles on it, and we simulate them. Right? This is the, the very, very simple uh, version of what we're about to talk to. So uh, Lee's going to take you through the editing part of this. Thank you, Andreas. So um, as Andreas has alluded to, we're engineers. And I wouldn't necessarily trust an engineer to create a aesthetically pleasing road network. So, we have to do something. We have to make some editor components. And realistically, this is, this is stuff you'll have seen before. I mean, these are mono behaviors. They're attached to game objects. And we can do this, and it's, it's absolutely fine. So you have a path, which represents a group of lanes with all the traffic going in the same direction. We have a global object which represents the global settings for the scene. It includes the vehicle pool that Andreas was talking to, talking about. And we also have individual settings for groups of lanes. And on the right of the slide, you can see one of these roads. OK. So in the keynote, you may have seen Martin editing a sub-scene. And these are used for the streaming. Um, we also use them, but not to stream the vehicles. We're purely using them as a way to bake out our data. And um, Andreas will go through baking a little later. So first thing the art artist will do is open the subscene. So now, hang on. No, fine. That's fine. <laughs> so here you can see, uh, or you possibly can see, the road network stretching into the background. It's all gray lines with the currently selected road. And I want to point out you have a hierarchy. This is exactly what every artist and designer and programmer who's used Unity will be familiar with. And here is the inspector. So we're looking at a single path. You have a set of waypoints at the top. These, if you've used Cinemachines pathing, will be familiar. Uh, the only call out really is we have a C and a P button, which are used to copy and paste points between roads. Uh, this is to help with certain setup requirements. Then you have an is reversed. An is reversed, to put it simply, is a nice, helpful way for an artist to design a road that matches um, roads we see around the world. Uh, they can create the right-hand side of the road. All the traffic flows in that direction. Then they can copy that road, paste it to the left, and tick the reversed box and now the traffic's going in the opposite direction. Uh, we have this concept of off-ramps, uh, which I called on-ramps, and that's stuck now. 
Um, but these are roads that come off a road and we give them a percentage chance for a vehicle to take this new route. And then we have a minimum and a maximum speed. So this is a restriction for cars on the road. Um, they will travel within this range, but they have their own idea as to the sort of speed that they wish to go. And finally, we have a couple of helpful artist tools. Uh, show all handles will create a handle for every point along this waypoint, and I'll cover colored roads in a sec. Uh, so, as I said, you can kind of make out the roads, but um, the feedback I got was it's a bit difficult to see what I'm doing. So I added a debug feature. Um, so this shows you green is roads traveling in the forward direction, I guess. Red are roads that have the reverse ticked. And the cyan colored are off ramps. OK. Now, these things are manipulated the same way you manipulate anything in Unity. You can drag your points around. You can drag the handles. You can insert points, delete points. You know, all the fun stuff. OK. The final thing I want to show you is we have this road settings. So in this case, you can see there's a pathing root object. There are then a set of designer named uh, roads, so distant roads, maze roads, trench roads, Chinatown. These are areas they just chose to name parts of the city. And below them are the roads. And here we have a script. It's a custom inspector, and it allows you to toggle the type of traffic models that can be seen on these roads. And primary reason this was done is in the original design, we were thinking along the lines of having all of the large trucks and you know the, the heavier vehicles towards the bottom of the city and all of the fancy cars up in the smog-free area of the city. OK, so the last thing an artist or designer will need to do is they will need to close the road network. Um, and funnily enough, it just involves pressing the close button. And it doesn't, it takes about that long. Um, and this forms the process of baking, which Andreas will cover later. Um, but you get a nice little statistical overview of the entities or the component data within that baked data. Uh, this is from a slightly older version of the scene. So I can see there are just over 2,000 vehicles. And there are nearly 600 road sections. Now, I haven't explained what a road section is yet. And I'm going to shy away from doing so until a bit later. For now, you can think of a road section as a small piece of one of those paths, which leads us to the simulation. Now, the simulation doesn't use any of these mono behaviors. That's a slight lie, actually, but uses one of them. But well, we're doing this with the uh, Unity Data Orientated Tech Stack. And the simulation really relies on the idea of many small systems being combined to form something slightly more complex. Um, and the key takeaway here is we're doing small amounts of work across all the cars and then doing the next set of work across all the cars. We are not doing all the work for one car then all the work for the next car. And, and this is cheap. You know, We're talking 0.2 milliseconds on the main thread, and about a millisecond for the 5,000 cars in the demo on the i7. So the data we use, um, this is split into two. We have the component data, and we have the arrays. Um, and we have arrays of road data. So, these are simply a sorted, sorted array of all of the road sections that we've just streamed in. We make a copy and store it for later use. And we have something called occupancy data, which is allocated every frame. And I will cover its use shortly. And then we have traditional component data. So vehicle pathing is the state for every car. Vehicle target position is a way that cars don't necessarily have to stick strictly to the path. So we can use steering. So they could potentially be influenced by something outside of the traffic system. And there are spawners. 
And spawners, funnily enough, do exactly what it sounds like they do. They put cars on the network. Okay. So we have a singular system, and it's imaginatively called traffic system. <laughs> Sorry. Its entire job is to schedule, uh, its entire purpose is to schedule all of the jobs that go into the simulation. And you can see there are, a, there are a few. And here's one in particular. So this is the code for the job that is responsible for updating the target position as well as the car's position along the path and its banking. Um, it is a generic, uh, it's an implementation of the generic iJob process component data interface. It takes two items, a vehicle pathing and a vehicle target position, which I talked about. So this is going to run for every entity that has these two components. And you can see our road sections array, which we, um, we use for working out the data for the paths. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute a bunch of information. Uh, we're going to compute a position, a tangent, and a concavity. And for those who don't know, concavity you can think of as being the rate of change of tangent. We take this information and we can calculate our world position for the car and our uh, amount of advancement along the curve. The other thing we compute here is we compute the banking. So this is the thing that gives the cars the tilt. And we clamp it to 45 degrees, and some of the reasoning behind this was not spilling, the driver's not spilling their coffee, but 45 is probably a bit extreme for that, so never mind. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's nothing particularly complex here. The other thing we need is we need awareness. We need the traffic to be aware of its surroundings to some degree. And we aren't using physics. We have no physics sim. We don't use raycasts in this demo. Um, this nice debug picture might give you an idea of what we do. We, we're literally creating a grid. And we are storing the vehicle's effect on that grid every frame. So we can assign up to 16 occupancy slots for a road section. This is a parallel array of occupancy slots. Um, 16 is an arbitrary number. It could be 32. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the point is, they are equi, uh, equal spaced. So I think I use 50 meters for a single slot. We allocate these, uh, sorry, we assign the cars to these every frame on the fly. And we use a process called backfilling to propagate the information into the network into a usable form. And the struct for this looks something like that. It just has a speed and a am I occupied, uh, where am I occupied is an ID unique to a car, which we might use at a later date. So what is, what is the process of filling and creating this occupancy? Well, here you can see a lane, and I've split it into slots. And the first job comes along, and it clears out the slots. So there's no cars in this, so everything is empty. And here's a car. Uh, so you can imagine this is on the road. This is near the front of the road. And the next job comes along, and it inserts the speed that that car is traveling and the fact that those two slots are occupied by this car. And the final step is we then go back through the road filling the speeds in to all the empty slots, and we subtly increase it. It's kind of a hack, but it looks reasonable. Now, that, that occupancy grid allows us to do a number of things. So um, let me just, can I go back? Ah, close. What you should be able to realize here is you can sample this grid, and you can you, a car could determine that if I'm looking at the first space, the fastest speed I can go and safely not hit a car in front is given by that slot at the beginning of the road. And so we use that for moderating speed, and we can also use this for lane changing. Lane changing 
is nothing more complicated than is the road I am is the road I'm on slower than the lane to my left or right? And I can just sample this. It's it's just data. It's just an array. So I can look to my left. I can go. Oh, looks like I can go quicker there. So I can swing out and change lanes. And we're doing this every frame. So if God forbid a car was coming up really fast on the middle lane and we were starting to pull out into it, we can reverse this decision. So the other thing that uses occupancy is spawning. Um, spawning is simple. It's literally just a counter. And when the counter gets to zero, it looks at the front of the road, and if the front of the road isn't occupied, it sticks a car on it. And despawning is even simpler. All that cares about is, has that car just run out of road? And if it has, remove it from the system. And as I've said, these are all jobs. So we have to use the ECS command buffers in order to be able to do the removal and the adding of entities and component data on a thread. Um, this command buffer helps to guarantee, I don't know what I'm talking about some days. <laughs> I don't know why I'm looking at you. Um, the command buffer sync allows it, you insert all this data into the queue, and the queue will be replayed at a certain point along the frame, guaranteed that when you next get updated, all of that work has been done on the main thread. OK, final, final system in place is merging and off ramps. So at the top, you can see traffic merging into the road, and at the bottom, you can see the off-ramps and the random nature of this. So as I say, it allows you to split and join traffic. You get far more interesting traffic patterns doing this than just having a spline with some cars going down it. Um, and the, the challenge really is the fact that we're now sharing occupancy. Uh, and yeah, we, we did cheat a bit, but it looks fine. So now I'll hand you back to Andreas. All right, thanks, Lee. You're welcome. Uh, so I mentioned this had to be cheap. Uh, we're doing a lot of work here, a lot of systems are doing stuff, right? And they're layered, and they're simple, but they still take up some time. Uh, on the main thread, we're about at 0.2 milliseconds. I think this is actually with safety checks on. It doesn't make much of a difference. Um, so we basically get in on the main thread, we schedule our jobs, we get out, like we're supposed to. So to find anything of what the actual timing looks like, you have to look at uh, the job threads. So let's do that. Uh, the first thing that happens uh, after all the clearing and housekeeping is pathing. So we run that. It's fully parallel. Um, we spend most of the time with the aware awareness. right? And that investment, I think, paid off with all these small features we'd be able to add, like lane changing and ramps and you know, actually reasonable spawning. Um, so there are a bunch of jobs here that compute we didn't actually go into all those jobs, but they compute things like aliasing, and they resolve sort of thread races trying to hit the same occupancy cell and sort of stuff like that. So we're spending about half the time on that. Uh, we, we can then use that information for all these very simple decision-making systems, like should I change a lane? Uh, can I spawn something, right? So that happens all here. And then we do the final transform and commit those, uh, those ideas. So, it's about one millisecond on an i7, uh, and you can reduce the car somewhat and get it to run really well on a mobile phone as well. So two optimizations I want to call out, one because it's fun and one because it was essential. So let's start with the essential one. Uh, you may be familiar with baking. As you know, Wikipedia describes it, you put stuff in the oven and you expose it to prolonged heat, which is not exactly what we did. It takes maybe one or two seconds to bake it, something like that. Uh, so You've seen the demo and the baking workflows in there, right? And uh, it's used there because we're streaming this baked data. And as Lee pointed out, we're not streaming these cars. There's no point. Like, all the cars in the world are always active, and they're always simulating at all times. Um, but we wanted to take the chance to pre-compute some data about the road network and use the same workflow. Um, if you are used to running these sort of simulations, um, you may be familiar with the, you know, those death by a thousand cuts that you can get from all the startup stalls that you have to pre-warm up systems. And you know, maybe computing stuff that you couldn't compute in the editor. Uh, so that's why we wanted to shove this into the baking pipeline. So I'll go with that. Um, really, our baking pipeline makes a binary blob of mostly ready-to-go entity data for you. 
So we have this representation in the editor, right? This is what our tooling works with. Um, it's essentially a mono behavior that represents the path or the road, as it were, and it has a bunch of points. At runtime, though, here's what we're actually working with. And so Lee talked about road sections, and this is just, we now see what it is, in fact. Uh, P1 and P2 here are the, the center points uh, in a spline, and so we've repeated this all the way through. So it's a very simple sample. You don't have to look at an array. So we have our Catmull ROM spline. It's all connected. If you're not familiar with these type of splines, like they will actually go through all their control points. So how do we get from here to there? Well, the first thing is that we have these sort of ghost points that you need to actually compute the correct tangents. So we have those. So what we do is we essentially turn this thing, which has three real points, into two road sections. The first road section is going to have A, B, and C, D. And we're going to link it up with the next one. Right? And so this, at bake time, we're able to reason about the indices that these things will have at runtime so that we can use a big read-only uh, space-efficient array of these things and have really quick random access. So even though it says link next here, it's not some crazy pointer to something. It's very often the, the, next, the next thing in the array. So that's cool. Like We can bake this and we can do a bunch of pre-computation. But here's another much cooler thing. We also wanted to put cars right from frame zero into the game. So this is what I'm talking about, right? When you normally, if you have a simulation like this and you want to get it to 5,000 cars before you actually show the world, right? You'd have like a loop or something and spin it for a couple of hundred times and maybe you get some cars in. Uh, but we're actually doing this at bake time. So what we do is we use the same runtime code that we have for spawning vehicles and we just run it across the road network at bake time. So the cars are actually there. What's cool about this is there's no difference between those cars and the ones that just spawn at runtime. They're the same thing. They're the same data, right? And so this may be like mind-blowing, uh, or it may be mundane. I don't know. Uh, to me, it was cool to think about just what sort of possibilities you can get from this. Like, it is simulation-ready data. It, it's ready to go as soon as you get in on frame one. OK, so let's briefly go over uh, the baking. I'm sure that will be covered better in other talks. But for our purposes, this is what you need to do. Right? Here's a way to convert entities. There's this interface. You convert game objects to entities. I'm sorry. So you get asked, can you convert this game object, which in our case is going to be either a path or a path. And if you can convert a, that thing, then you basically you're handed an entity manager that says, all right, fine, you can convert this game object to an entity. Why don't you stage everything you need here, right? And whatever you're putting in there, whatever components, whatever data you're putting in there, you're staging so that it'd be ready to go at runtime. So I mentioned row baking. Let's take a look at that first. It's really very simple. Uh, the only thing really to call out beside that conversion that I showed with the points is that we're also taking the opportunity to pre-compute a bunch of stuff, like the arc length of the Catmull ROM spline segment. Not something you want to be doing on the first frame to create a hitch, right? It's much better to pre-compute it, because we know that these curves are static. And then so when you're done and you've filled this component data out with your properties, you basically say, OK, make an entity, add the thing to it, I'm done. Like, and the, the rest of the framework that we have in this sample converts it and loads it at runtime. So the more interesting part is the, the simulation-ready cars. And I'm sorry, there's no like, magic code here that's going to revolutionize your life. It's just the same spawning code that we use at runtime. Uh, but it's then run in the editor as you're baking. So I would like to call this out, because it's all structs all the way down, right, when you're working with pure ECS data. You can do something like take a random number generator and stick it in here and serialize it and then start simulating using that random number generator seed from the first frame. This is just like one of those linear feedback register-based generators, and so there's no magic. Like there are no crazy classes or inner things you can't get to. It's just simple data, which is very nice and makes something like this trivial to do. And finally, you can also set up your shared components, of course, like, and there's no difference here. So, but we're also deciding what the vehicles look like, and we're picking from the spawn pool and doing all those things in the editor just like we would at runtime. The other optimization I would like to cover is more of a fun one. So I was profiling this, and I looked at the final transform pass. And it's computing, um, and we talked about banking and how we're computing those angles. So banking is essentially rotation around your local forward vector. And the code was slow, so I was looking at it, and it's doing quaternion axis angle, right, 
around the axis of 0, 0, 1, which is the local forward vector, and it's generating a quaternion with this bank amount of radians to be post-multiplied onto the other quaternion. So why is this slow? Well, if you look inside of axis angle, it has to take that angle in radians and use sine cos to compute both the sine and the cosine of these two things so that it can make a quaternion for you to multiply with. And in our case, right, the axis is always 0, 0, 1. So we're going to end up with a quaternion that looks like 0, 0, the sine of the half angle, and the cosine of the half angle. All right, so what, what can we do about this? Just give up and go home. No, of course not. So we can do something, right? Sine and cosine are slow right now because uh, we don't really have a way to tune the position of that in a great way in burst. So it, it'll give you a really accurate value which we don't need for this because we're tilting one out of 5,000 cars that probably no one really needs to look at. So what does the data look like? Always the question you should ask yourself. So we had mentioned before that you know, we're just banking around the two axes, so the resulting quaternion is going to look like this. right? For our radians, which is going to be uh, negative 0 0.8 to about 0.8, we have x, y, z, w. Z is going to be from about negative 0.38 to positive 0.38, and W is going to be close to 1. That's just what the data looks like, and it corresponds to these things that I showed in the expression. So I was annoyed by this. I was looking at this, and I'm like, this is too much of a time hit. Like, I don't want to have an embarrassing sine and cosine clown right in the middle of my profiling. It's like, I want to show this running efficiently. So what can we do about this? Well, if you want to snow in on something and just waste the day, you can do what I did, which is to read about how do people approximate these things. And I knew of some of these things, but not all of them. So it was a good recap. Anyway, you might land at something like Taylor series. So Taylor series says, to compute sine of x, you can take that mathematical gooblegook on the left-hand side here, which says, assuming you have infinite processing time, you can sum all of the values from 0 to infinity of this sub-expression. Um, Right, which works out to be x minus x cubed divided by 3 factorial plus x to the fifth power divided by fifth factorial, and so on and so on, for all x. It's the for all x part that people don't really do. They do you know, a few of these, and then you're at the limit of what floating point precision can give you anyway, and so it doesn't matter. And cosine of x is similar. Uh, so what does it look like? Well, if you do this, so here I plotted in purple is the ground truth over the range of uh, minus pi to pi. And we have the first Taylor expansion of sine of x here. So just one term, right? So this is x uh, minus x cubed divided by 6. And you get this thing. So you know it's not a great approximation at pi, uh, but it's really good around 0. And here's cosine and the first Taylor expansion of that. You can also see that it's terrible <laughs> at the edges, but it's really good around zero. OK, so we mentioned we didn't want people driving their cars to spill coffee. So we're not banking that much. And yeah, I agree, 45 degrees is ridiculous. Like, I would not want to hold my cup of coffee like that. <laughs> Still, that was the range that we had. And it turns out, you know, you saw the, the quaternion uh, further reduces that by half. So really, the range that we care about is uh, negative pi over 8 to pi over 8 radians. And like I said, we have 5,000 of these, so what's the odds of someone looking at this one? So here's the ground truth reference that we want in this particular range of data that we care about. Right? This looks much more manageable. It's not crazy. It's not all, all over the place. And in fact, if you take this and you overlay your Taylor expansions uh, of a first term, it's so close that you can barely tell them apart. So that's great news. Great. So we can write this thing that says, OK, give me a quaternion that does a really quick approximation over this small range, and I know it's OK, and please don't hurt me. Uh, you get this, right? And this computes that first Taylor expansion for cosine and sine, and you get this quaternion out. But like, we're a bunch of programmers, right? No one's going to look at that thing and say, that's not a straight line. Isn't that what everyone in the room thought? So let me ask you a question again. What's the minimum energy we can spend on this? So I apologize to any math majors in the room. All right, sine of x is x. This gives us a, an error about 2.5%, which is mostly OK. 
Here's the one that, here's the one that you may have more trouble with. Cosine of x is 1. 7.5% error. Does it really matter? I, I couldn't tell the difference. That one looks pretty good. So I present to you the YOLO edition of Quaternion Math, <laughs> which is to divide your angle by 2 and stick it in the Z field, and it's good enough. And we have answered the question of how, can we, how much can we reduce this? I will further point out that the burst compiler helpfully folds that 0.5 multiplication into something else. So it is, in fact, free. All we're doing is putting it into the field. Uh, all right, so to wrap up this talk, um, baking, I think, is a really helpful optimization for us. It got rid of the startup stalls. Everything is there on the first frame. And more importantly, as you guys are starting to get into ECS and experiment with these workflows, you'll find that your existing investment in mono behavior tooling can go with you, right, as you, you convert stuff later. And this whole thing, I think, is a cool example of what it means to layer small sort of um, individual behaviors that do one specific thing and then running them in parallel can give you both great performance and a somewhat interesting simulation. That's the end of our talk and we're ready for questions. So there's microphones over there and over there and just, or you can also find us after the talk. So uh, why, why didn't you bake the, uh, the banking data into the path itself and then just have the vehicle sample from that? You could do that, but then we'd lose the ability to actually go off path. <laughs> Fair so, enough. Yeah, so it's a trade-off. But totally right. If you just wanted some background traffic that you could never run into, yeah, for sure. You could have totally done that. Just have a separate you know, spline approximation of the bank angle or something. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great talk. Uh, fantastic. My name is Lex, Unity developer, uh, white label AR. Uh, this is definitely the future. Uh, and I was specifically excited about the no physics, right? That's, that's definitely a, a plus. And then you, uh, the road um, management, right? So that's on a 2D surface. Uh, what do you think in terms of like the future of nav mesh with 3D uh, spatial position? And, and essentially that solution that you came up with, can that be, um, matrixed out to three dimensions? Do you see that as, as like a, a viable solution for um, spatial problems in the future using that kind of uh, simplification? Um, it's a good question. I think that this, this part of what we're doing, avoidance, I think has a part even in sort of like character versus character avoidance, right? And I think it's complementary to pathfinding. Uh, so these cars never actually take any intelligent decisions. Like there's no pathfinding in this demo, but there is avoidance, mm -hmm. right? There's that sort of last minute intelligence. So, you know, the traditional split between pathfinding and avoidance is that you do your path planning, right? You can do that at a very low rate because that's all you need, but then stuff happens and there's someone right in front of you, right? And those are mostly orthogonal. So we implemented that part in, in this sample, but we haven't really cared about the, the whole planning thing. So I don't really see how they're, I think they're complementary and they don't really encroach. Yeah, because it seems like it's, it's almost redefining AI. I mean, it's, it's not completely intelligence. It's, it's very simple laws that it yeah. obeys, but it's the perception of intelligence. So exactly, right. yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, so thank you. All right, thank you. Let's go over here. Uh, so as someone who's written several things like this uh, before in Unity and outside of Unity, uh, when will these samples be available for people like me who do me mess with a lot of spline data uh, to take a look at it and at least, if not use the same tools, at least to learn how to, we can modify it for our own purposes? Or is that just more of a next year? Sort yeah, of we're going to drop it all next year. That's okay. I, I can promise you that. I, thank but, you very much. I mean, to be fair, there should be enough in this presentation for you to fill in the gaps. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not it, difficult. If, if you want to start working on this the minute you get home, uh, Lee has just signed up to get you started. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see, more questions. Um, you said you turned off all ray casting. So is all physics completely? We didn't turn off? them off. We don't have them. So you don't have them. So is all physics completely off on that 
environment? The, yeah, there is no physics there in is the no pure physics. ECS space yet. So um, how do you get rid of the physics like com compilation? And how stuff? do I get rid of the physics? Yeah, how, how do you? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Like, it's not there to begin with, so we can't remove it. Like, if, in, in the pure ECS I, I haven't ECS been space, able to remove physics from my environment. I haven't been able to turn it off in Unity. Like, how do you turn it oh, off? Oh, you mean turn it off for Unity? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I'm very poor at Unity in general, but I'm slowly learning, so now I understand what you mean. Um, I don't think anyone bothered, uh, because there are no actual physics bodies in the simulation, so hopefully the physics system, if active, does nothing, because we're not actually using it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, the occupancy grids, how did they, were they straight segments along the curve? And how did they meet each other? How did you go from one grid to the next? Uh, so one grid, um, I mean, these, 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 these are just parallel arrays, yeah? Um, so if we have the array of road sections, the array of occupancy overlaps that. So uh, the road section and the occupancy in the same slot are talking about the same part of the road. Um, so going, going forward through this, we can follow the road section's links to get the next index. Going sideways is something I didn't touch on, but a road is a single spline, but that spline is actually multiple lanes coming out. Yeah. Okay, so I think I get it. you can yeah. kind of, yeah. Thanks. And so you can think of it as like bent pixels along a path, if you will, or like it doesn't really matter as long as it's conservative, right? Yeah. The goal is not to have things overlapping. Yeah. yeah. So I guess if, if you did an extreme 90 or a 180 degree bend, you know, there would actually be some overlap, Thanks. right? And that wouldn't work out great. Um, so if you were going to scale this up, uh, say a hundred or a thousand times, like to the point where you've got maybe uh, a million cars. Mm -hmm. What would be your bottlenecks, and uh, I guess what would your approach be to solve that? It's a good question. Um, I can think of a couple of things, right? Where, where are you going to put those million cars? I mean, most of them are going to be in the distance, for sure. So I think some sort of LOD would be required at that point. Yeah. And in this demo, like, like we talked about, there's no LED at all. We just burned through it all, right, <laughs> because it was fast enough. Uh, but if you wanted to, you know, go up three or four levels of magnitude here, um, well, I can think of, you know, doing multiple levels of LED. Uh, and then, I mean, at that point, there are going to be dots, right? And so you could probably do can sort of animation loops playing in the very far background. And as you get closer, you can sort of migrate into a system like this. When you say LODs, do you mean uh, like graphical LODs or simulation? No, system LODs. Cool. Right? I mean, there's not enough pixels, really, to draw a million cars. So, I mean, you're not going to be looking at all of them. So faking it starts to become important. At, at that scale, right? But there, there was no, well, apart, apart from our uh, not particularly physically correct implementation, <laughs> there was no faking as such in this demo. Like, all the cars are truly moving, which is nice because the sound sources update behind you and, like, you get that soundscape for free. Uh, so I think if I was, if, if the marching orders were put a million cars in, then I would have some sort of, like, radial LOD. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and I mean, this scales relatively linearly. You know, um, we can increase the number of cars, and it's going. We know what it's going to cost us. Ten thousand will cost us roughly two milliseconds. Yeah, and, so and also on. at that scale, I think you could do things like occasionally push the cars along, right, and just have that be. You know, they just do linear interpolation most of the time, and then you just take some steering decisions every now and then and rotate through the million. There, there's any number of ways to do it. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Last question. I think we're out of here. So, all right, get the last question. Uh, congratulations on the really impressive uh, demo. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have, I guess, two questions that go into the complexity of the demo. One thing I was really hoping to see was the, the player car flying to the path of the oncoming traffic to see how the traffic would respond, but it sounds like it wouldn't. It would, but uh, it was not exactly what we wanted to put front and center in the demo. But what, by the time we release it, uh, we, we have avoidance actually built in with full steering behaviors for the cars too. Uh, we didn't talk about it today because we didn't think it looks cool yet. So. so the player car actually would track to any grid that was in the city? Uh, no. Does it a different way? Yeah, it does it a different way. 
But okay. Yeah. So then, by the time we'll release it, I hope we'll have uh, you know some accompanying blog posts to talk about that. All right. But it's that's really essentially cool. a bunch of classical steering and avoidance and all those things implemented in DCS as well, using the same patterns that you saw here today, right? Okay. Let's do uh, let's do player avoidance. Let's do avoiding each other. Let's all bunch up into cells and like compute steering vectors and all that stuff, and. It looks cool when it looks cool, but we would, did, didn't want to put that in the keynote until it looks really cool. So uh, by the time you, you get your hands on it, you should have that too. That sounds very exciting. Can I have one more follow-up? Uh, right. When you say no physics, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no collision detection, right? Like, could you run through a building or sure. not? Sure. Yes, you <laughs> yes. could? The, yes, there's no oh, okay. collision. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.